This morning, uh, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that's where our lesson will <clears throat> come from this morning. Of course, if you're familiar with that passage, you can probably guess what this lesson is about. We'll be talking about love today and its importance in our endeavor to have a unity of God's people, uh, both here and, and abroad. So very important. And I do think it's important to note, as, as Matt has read for us this morning, the last part of chapter 12... But also looking at chapter 12 and also looking at chapter 14. We don't have time to go over all that this morning. But chapter 12 we'll cover in another lesson as we talk about uh, all of our importance in, in the body of Christ. That, that we may be many members and have many different uses and many different purposes and many different talents. We, there are many different organs in one body, but all of them work in unison to help the body to perform in the way that it needs to. That's what chapter 12 is about. He touches on uh, all the different talents and abilities. He talks about tongues. He talks some about prophecy. And then he goes into chapter 14 and talks more about those prophecies and more about those works and about having order as you're together as a congregation of the Lord's people. And although when he wrote this letter, obviously it probably wasn't in chapter form, book, chapter, verse as we have it, but it's, it's I think, not just by chance and really not that ironic that, that he places love sandwiched between those two ideas. And I think this morning as we begin to look at, at, at 1 Corinthians 13, I think what we need to understand is that it really doesn't matter what your abilities are or how good you are at doing those things, whether that's doing things or saying things or whatever it may be that you can do in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter so much what you say or do as it is, is how you go about doing it. And you might be the most talented person in, in the world. You might be the most talented person among the body of Christ. But if you don't do whatever you're doing, if you don't carry out whatever ability you have to carry out with love, it profits nothing. That is the message of chapter 13. And I think Paul wanted the church at Corinth to understand that because Corinth was struggling with, excuse me, with all of these gifts. They were struggling with, with all of these different things that they were able to do, and they were a very talented group of people, but it was becoming to be more about them and more about what they could do and the attention that they could draw from that as opposed to the idea of doing that in love and helping to build up the brethren. So love has to be center stage if we are going to be a unified group of God's people. I find it very fitting how he ends chapter 12 and he says, I show you a more excellent way. Well, what is that more excellent way? Well, he spends the entirety of chapter 13 answering and telling what the more excellent way is, and that is love. It's not just about the abilities. It's not just about the doing. It's not just about the saying. It's about the motives from which we do that. And what we possess within our hearts as we serve God and each other. And it has to be in love. If it's not in love, then it's fruitless. So he says, I'll show you a more excellent way. And I'll attempt to do that this morning as we look at Paul's words from the inspiration of God. The first thing that we're going to look at this morning is that love has everything to do, just like I've just stated, it has everything to do with our motive. I want you to look there in verses 1 through 3 with me. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Tongues served their purpose in that day. They were to fully establish God's Word. Uh, they were to reach everybody who was in certain settings, depending on what language they talked or spoke. And, and it served its purpose and served its time, as did miracles, and as did healings, and as did the removal of demons, and all those different things that Christ and the apostles did. Those things, just like tongues, served a purpose for their time, that the Word might be fully established. And Paul, Paul alludes to that at the end of this chapter. We won't talk about all that today, but that was the purpose then. But what they needed to understand and what we need to understand in regards to our abilities, not just tongues, but anything, that doing that for the benefit of the others was most important. 
But if they were not carrying those things out for the benefit of others, then it was pointless and it was fruitless. In other words, he says, if you're doing it for self only, then you might as well not be doing it because you're only a racket at that point. <clears throat> there was a guy one time that I heard questioned about his ability to speak in tongues. Of course he couldn't. Uh, any speaking of tongues we have nowadays is really just a theatrical show to get attention. But he was cornered and questioned about, so you speak in tongues? Yes, I speak in tongues. Why do you speak in tongues? You know what his answer was? His answer was, it edifies me. That's what he said. It edifies me. I edify myself when I speak in tongues. Well, what a perfect answer because he's exactly right because that's all it did. It didn't edify anybody else because nobody had a clue what he was saying. If they did, they were lying. No matter what we do, and again, tongues is not our issue. It was theirs. But no matter what you do, if, if you're not doing it in love... Paul says you might as well be banging that brass or clanging that cymbal, which to them meant idol worship. That word cymbal or clanging cymbal there was the same cymbal that they used to worship false gods in that day. The same Greek word. Isn't that amazing? And Paul says you might as well be worshiping those silly idols if you do whatever you're doing and you don't do it in love. That's a pretty strong statement, but that's what he said. If love is not our motive, we're missing something very, very serious. He also goes on to prophecies or telling of things to come or maybe this applies to us more, our understanding and our knowledge. And even if we had all faith, even the faith like Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20 where Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, I want you to move from here and go over there and it'll move. In other words, all things are possible through faith. He says, even if you have all faith but have not love... It profits nothing. Again, that's a, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? It's a very strong statement. Even if we possess all of this and we don't have love, we've missed it. We've missed it. And you might say, well, that's a pretty strong faith. It is. But if we don't have faith and if we don't operate in our faith with love as center stage, then what's the point? Just like we had with the children this morning, just like Cal read for us, God is love, and if we're not loving others, then we're not of God, and that faith is pointless. We've got to have love no matter what we do. And he really kind of seals the point here when he says with our good deeds, and though I bestow all of my gifts to feed the poor, and though I do all these good things, and I just give everything that I have to everyone else, if I don't do it in love... It profits nothing. I can't help but think of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 when I think about this. What did they do? They had a possession, a piece of land. They sold it and brought it to the disciples, laid it at their feet as if it was the whole, but it wasn't. I won't go into all, the, the, all the, the background and all the details of all of that, but what it was, at the very bare minimum, was a show of what they wanted to think others it was, but truthfully it was something else. They weren't doing it in love. If they were doing it in love, they would have been trying to be deceitful. But they were putting on a show, and even the good that they did do was not accepted. Why? Because they did not do it in love, and they lied to the Holy Spirit. And they lost their life for it. Do we understand that? Love has to be our motive. Selfish actions, remember this, selfish actions do not produce spiritual maturity. It never will. Motives have to be centered around love. And no matter the gifts, the talents, or whatever we have, even if we're the best at what we do, those gifts and those talents, or those talents they're, they're not valueless. But the person who does it and does not do it in love, that person becomes valueless. And that's a frightening statement. But that's essentially what Paul says. Though I do all these things... It profits me nothing. There's no value in it if I don't have love. I ask you, why do you do what you do in your life? We're going to talk tonight about our actions, the things that we do, and maybe things that we don't do. But when you do good things in your life, what's your motive? Is it love or is it, I'm just doing this because I have to? Friends, there's a big difference. Doing it in love makes it completely different. 
Paul says, no matter what I do, no matter what you do, Corinth, if you don't do it in love, it profits nothing. Secondly, what does that more excellent way look like? He, he closed the, the previous thought in chapter 12 saying, I'll show you a more excellent way. Then he begins the next thought by saying, it doesn't matter what you do or say or how good you are at it. If you don't have love, you're nothing. And then he goes in verses 4 through 7 and, and literally gives descri clear descriptions of what love is and what it looks like. Let's go through that this morning. To begin with, he says that love suffers long. Love suffers long. Now, I've got a little bit to cover here, so I'm going to try to roll on pretty fast. Love suffers long. Each one of these could be a lesson in and of themselves. But the Greek word there means that somebody is patient. Their love suffers long. It endures for a long time. In other words, no matter the evil, uh, no matter how personal an offense may be or indirect an offense may be, that love loves them no matter what. On the other side of that, even if it's a prodigal that we're talking about that has made terrible decisions, um, has blown everything in their life, has blown every opportunity they've been given, and probably deserves to be eating with the pigs, but still we love them anyways. That's that agape love that we talk about that comes from the word charity as we read in the King James Version. That Greek word there is agape. That's what that word means. It means to be long-suffering regardless of the conditions. It means unconditional. In other words, we don't love based on certain conditions and credentials that everybody has to meet and then we'll love them. No. We love even when that love is not deserved. That's what it means that love suffers long. It also means that love is kind. The Greek word there means to be courteous, to be helpful, to show and to shower people with favors, to reach out in kindness. And, and, and you'll be amazed. You, you can see this in the workplace. Uh, you can see this in any relationship, whether it's within the home or outside of the home. The smallest acts of, of kindness, the smallest gestures of kindness go a long way. Sometimes we think that, that we have to spend a lot of money or do something uh, really, really extravagant to really be kind to somebody. Sometimes it's just the smallest things. I've always been amazed <laughs> at, at, at children, at whether it's, it's birthday or Christmas time or whatever, and they may get all these presents and, and you turn around and what are they playing with? They play with a box that came in. And you know, as adults, we're the same way. <laughs> It, it, it's not sometimes the, the great, big, powerful, in-your-face things that really make our day. It's just the kind, small gestures. Just a cup of cold water. No wonder Jesus pointed to that. We need to be more kind. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. In other words, love is not jealous. It doesn't look at what other people have and say, man, why can't I have that? Or why do they deserve that more than I have that? Look at what I do. What do they do? We shouldn't think that way. That's not love. Love doesn't have feelings against other people because of what they have. It, it doesn't begrudge or attack or downplay people because of their successes and try to blow us up. No, love shares. Love rejoices. It rejoices in the experiences of others. And I want to ask you, how do you feel when other people are successful? I hear this phrase a lot in life. I'm sure you've heard it before. We'll look at somebody and look at their successes and we'll say, boy, that's nice. What do we mean by that? Do we really mean, boy, that's nice? Or do we really mean, boy, I wish I could have that too? In my experience, what I've seen when people say, boy, that's nice, for those that are they're talking about is generally it's probably not that nice. They probably have to work really, really hard. They may have a lot of responsibilities that, that don't meet the surface, and it may really not be that nice. But that's our mentality of thinking, why them, not me? That, that's not love. Love doesn't envy. Love rejoices when other people are successful and celebrates with them. Love doesn't parade itself. I saw where one commentator, and you, you can read through 1 Corinthians 13 and through commentaries, and you'll get a lot of different, really interesting um, analysis on this chapter. But one commentator said that love is not like an old bullfrog that's about to let out one of those big croaks. You ever seen one? He blows up real big, and he just swells up, and then he just lets it all out. That's to parade itself. That, that's what that means. It means to parade itself. It means to swell up and to fill up with air and then just let it all out and say, hey, look at me. Love doesn't do that. Love is not boastful. 
Love is, is not parading itself. It doesn't seek to applaud itself. It seeks to applaud the other person. Ask yourself this. Who is your biggest fan? Who is your biggest fan in life? Is it you? <laughs> and chances are your love is not what it needs to be. I'm not saying you can't have self-confidence. I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe in ourselves. Not at all. But if we are our biggest fan and everybody else is secondary, then chances are our love is not reaching the level it needs to. Love does not parade itself, but it seeks to applause that other person. Kind of to go along with it, love is not puffed up. In other words, love is not prideful. Love is not arrogant. Love is not conceited. Love doesn't act as if it's better than somebody else. I had that conversation quite a bit with our kids over the years. I hope I'm not that way. I had that drilled into my head. I hope my children don't turn out that way either because I'll tell you something. When you walk around and act as if you're better than somebody else, you will ruin your influence. And you will ruin the unity of God's church. It's so important that Jesus talked about it in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, When you come into a wedding feast, He said, Do not be the one that looks at the best seat and goes up there and plops down and says, Ha! Here I am. I got the best seat. He says, You don't do that. He says, You take a humble seat, and then when somebody else comes in, you say, You go up higher. Why is that? Well, what he says there is that if you go to that higher seat first and later on the master of the feast comes in and he realizes that you don't belong there and he says, hey, buddy, you, you ain't that high up. You go sit over here back where you belong and you walk down there with shame. He said, nobody wins there. He says, but when you take the lowly spot and tell somebody else to go up higher and in time, what his point is, is in God's time when he seeks to exalt you and he says, hey, it's time for you to go sit up here, that's okay because he put you there. You didn't put yourself there. Why is it that we've always got to try to have the best seat in life? I'm not saying it at the movie theater or at the ball field or whatever. I don't, I don't blame you for wanting to have a good seat and be able to see what all is going on. But I'm talking about in life. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. And if we really love in the way that we need to love, we won't always be trying to have the best seat because we think we deserve it. Let God decide that. Not us. Love is not puffed up. But love says, hey, you take the best and I'll, I'll sit over here. Have you ever thought about if we really operated that way and if the world really operated that way, how much different things would be? <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, who'd be out of business? Every news station and news channel in this entire world would be out of business because there wouldn't be any bad things to talk about anymore because all the problems would be fixed just like that. We need to love more, and we don't need to be so puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Boy, that's a struggle nowadays, isn't it? There's a lot of indecency out there, unmannerly, disgraceful people that do not treat each other with respect, but love treats each other with respect, even if they don't agree with you. Especially in a, in a, in a year of, of an election that we're in when politics are at their just highest in the heat of the race and all this stuff. We live in a society today that, that if somebody doesn't agree with you, that translates they hate your guts. That's how they treat each other. That's how we often treat each other in society, and that's not right. Just because somebody doesn't see eye to eye with us doesn't mean that we're automatically their enemies or we're theirs or they're ours. That's not, that's not love, is it? Sometimes that's what happens. Love does not seek her own or does not seek its own. In other words, it's not selfish. I saw where one described it in this way. Love does not insist upon its own rights. Don't you love the person that just has to tell you what their rights are? I deal with, the, deal with the public a lot, as, as you know, in, in my secular work. And it is amazing to me how many people want you to know what's theirs. They want you to know what they're entitled to. Not that you said they're not. But some people just want you to know. We, we have to go on people's property a lot and sometimes get in their backyards and do different things. And we try to, try to communicate and try to let people know what we're doing. But, but some people are just... Like, they don't even want you to even look at their place. And if you do, they want you to know that that is theirs. And they were acting really ugly about that. And then when the lights go off, they, they, they change their attitudes pretty quickly. But, but, but it's as if to say, I just want you to know that. This is mine, and this is me, and I've got to say here. And that may be true, but if we wear that in the forefront of our lives just to say, tell people, hey, look at me, is that, 
Is that love? Love does not insist upon its own rights. In other words, it says to somebody else, you go up higher. But love does not insist that it be acknowledged. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not a person who goes around and just walks around with a chip on their shoulder. Love is not offensive and defensive. Love is, is calm. Love is not easily aroused to anger and does not become exasperated. In other words, it's thick-skinned and it's somebody who seeks to have peace and to control their emotions. Love doesn't think evil. I heard it described in this way, love does not keep records. See that? Love does not keep records. In other words, and we'll talk about this more in another lesson on forgiveness, but love does not keep records of everything that's ever been done and always brings them up and charges people over and over and over and over and over again with them. That's thinking evil. That's being resentful. That's being vengeful. Love doesn't do that. Love controls that emotion. It suffers the evil and seeks to forget about it and move on with life. Do we really love? Love does not rejoice in iniquity. You've heard me talk about this before. I, I really believe we live in a society that, that the reason that these um, <clears throat> reality shows and these shows that, that follow people around their lives and sees all their problems, that's why they do so well because we rejoice in the faults of others for whatever reason. That's kind of a sick, twisted thing you think about it, but that's what we do. Love does not take pleasure or, or, or feed on sin. Love is not happy when other people fail. When other people fail. Love is not eager to pass along a story about, oh, did you hear about what old so-and-so did the other day? Listen to this. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't rejoice when there's bad. But love, on the other hand, rejoices when there's truth. I'm afraid sometimes we're, we're much like that, that pack of dogs that when one dog goes down, the other dogs jump on it because, well, that's a weak one and now we've got something to talk about. When other people are struggling, if we really love, we see that love as an opportunity to say, hey, here is a, a time to show God's love and to build somebody back up. What's wrong with that? Love seeks truth and does not rejoice in iniquity. <clears throat> love bears all things. I'm about to pick it up here. But love bears all things, which means ultimately in the Greek that it bears the weight of whatever is put on it. Pretty good illustration of that is Jesus bearing the cross, bearing our sins. Regardless of whether he deserved that or not, and of course he didn't, but he still bared those things. Do we bear all things or do we crumble when relationships falter? Love believes all things and is eager to believe the best. Love, here, here's something else. Love sees, think about this, love sees what's going on and seeks to understand the whole story and understand the circumstances and see that that might be a contributing factor to why somebody's acting the way they are. And they seek to understand that maybe this person can do better. And they seek to help them to do better. For instance, the adulterous lady in John chapter 8. By all intended purposes, she was not living probably the best of lives. Jesus addressed that, but he didn't focus on the faults. He focused on correcting the faults and doing better in the future. He believed all things in accordance with this lady that everybody else wanted to stone. That's love. Do we love in that way? That's the more excellent way. Love hopes all things. In other words, never ceases to hope. And when somebody is at their lowest of lows, love looks at them and says, there is a better path for you. Because that will triumph in the end. And this is not your end. Love endures all things. That's a strong word there. The word endureth is a strong military term that means to, to stand strong against the onslaught of the enemy. Love endures everything. No matter the attack, no matter the ferociousness of the attack, love stands strong. And he said all that to say this. And we understand from this reading that love has a powerful permanence. <clears throat> what does he say at the beginning of verse 8? He says, love never fails. Love never fails. That's powerful. The word fails there is an, is an interesting term. It comes from the Greek word that means one of two things. It means to be hissed off of stage or booed because of a bad performance. 
And it also has reference to the flower that withers away or falls away. That's what the word fails mean. So what, what Paul is saying there is that love is never booed off a of stage. The performance of love is never a sham. The performance of love is never a joke. And when the rain stops and the heat bears down, love never withers away. Now how's your love? Is our love often hissed off of stage because it was not what people were hoping for? I hope not. And I hope we hold up under the pressure because this should never happen to true love. Love has a powerful permanence and above all it says in verse 13 that love is the greatest of all. Faith is important, yes. Of course faith is important. Hope is important, yes. And love is really important, but above all those things, love is the climax of all of those virtues because love lasts forever. And that's why Paul told the church at Colossae, in Colossians 3 and verse 14, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We're talking about peace, we're talking about unity, and it's that love that holds us together. That is the most important thing. Again, to restate what we said, it's not whether you have this gift or that one. Those things are important, yes. But what's most important is that you love as you do whatever you do. And if we have that love that we need, if we have that love that, that, that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13, then my friends, we're right on track. I'm about out of time this morning. I don't have time to really do this. But I want you to just kind of skim over 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, and do something for me. You may have to take time to do it after you leave here today. But it's something that we need to do often. You take 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, and you take love and you remove it and you put Jesus in place of love and you read that passage. What you will find is a clear description of love, but a clear description of who Jesus really was and is and will always be. For instance, starting there in verse 4, you would say, Jesus suffers long, and Jesus is kind, and Jesus doesn't envy, and Jesus doesn't parade himself. You see what I'm talking about? Do that, read it that way, and get a good picture of what Christ was and how he treated people. Now here's the self-check, and here's the part that I don't like about this lesson. Put Daniel's name in there. You put your name in there. We place our names in there, and then we read that chapter. Is that a perfect description of you? Or is there something like it? You see, when we read about love, we see Jesus in every way. And when we put ourselves into that situation, the question is, do we add up like Jesus adds up? Or is there something like it? If love is present then there is unity. There is peace. Problems will exist. They won't go away, but they'll be dealt with in the right way. Because love, true love, conquers all things. Now where do you stand this morning? Where do I stand this morning? I've already done what I've just asked you to do. I don't really always like the results that I see there. I know I need to do some work. I've got some work to do. Chances are, we all do. But understanding that and knowing that's half the battle. So let's all make a, a vow today and let's make it our goal to love more and to understand what that really means. And no matter what we do or say, we might, we've got to make sure that we love as we do. That love is our motive. Because without love, we are nothing. Appreciate your attention today. Let's all strive to love each other more and to carry that out in the way that, that we live every day. Jesus loves you. We've already sung that with our children this morning. We need to remember that every day. And you may see in your life today that there are things that are lacking. There's a great love for you that is always readily available. And you can make those changes to be right with God today. Whether that means you need to be restored, or whether that means you need to become a Christian today and be baptized. God loves you, and you're loved. And we love you. And we all want to get to heaven together. So if we can help you in any way today, won't you come while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat>